Hello, everybody. Um, welcome um, to today's Aspen event. As you see, um, we are still transferring our participants from the waiting room into the main room, which is going to take just a couple of seconds. Um, and then we are going to start. This is one of the, uh, as you all know, I haven't been with Aspen for a long time yet, um, a little bit more than a year. And this is going to be one of the uh, most important meetings um, I have hosted so far um, at the Aspen um, Institute. Um, welcome everybody to our round discussion round on Putin's war on Ukraine, is the West doing um, enough? And what we want to discuss today is not um, about the Ukraine, but with Ukrainians. Um, and um, it is a particular pleasure. Um, and I really, really want to thank um, you two for joining us today, um, Lizia Vasilenko um, and Halina Janchenko. Thank you so much to the two of you um, that you joined our Zoom meeting um, from Kiev. And we know um, that uh, Lesia, you don't have so much time. You're right now sitting in a car. Um, so we want to pretty much jump right into hearing from you without a lot of introduction from me into the topic. I think we all know um, uh, what, what is, or at least we see what is going on. Also, um, we are also joined uh, today by two um, German parliamentarians, um, Metin Hackverdi, um, from, um, I thank you so much, um, Mietin, for joining us um, today, um, as well as Robin Wagner um, from the Green Party. Mietin um, is from the SPD. And what I would propose, um, instead of that, I am going to introduce all of our four speakers again. Um, Emily and, um, and Janek, why don't you post the CVs um, into the chat function so that we don't lose any time? Um, and go right into hearing from, um, from Lesia what is happening on the ground, um, what is the situation, and also how you are perceiving um, what uh, Germany, the European Union, and, uh, and the United States are doing. Okay, so I'll just jump right into it, and then uh, Helena uh, will uh, uh, tell her side of the story and supplement anything that I may have missed. Uh, I think it is uh, quite obvious that Ukraine is in a war. We've been in this war for eight days now, and uh, I'm proud to say that we are still standing stronger than ever and united than, uh, more than ever. And uh, rest assured that Ukraine and Ukrainians will stand for their country until the very end. What, by that, I mean until the very last of the Russian soldiers gets the hell out of Ukraine. And I'm sorry for using strong language now because we are literally in eight days of war. This is the kind of war uh, that you read in history books about, the sort of uh, that uh, Europe has seen last during World War II. Uh, literally all of Ukraine is on fire. We get uh, air raid messages and missile strike messages every hour, sometimes a couple in an hour. And every time it's simultaneously up to 12, 15 cities that are being hit. What the Russians are doing right now is they are hitting civilian targets. They are hitting residential units. They are hitting houses, schools, kindergartens, um, Yesterday, they hit a, a maternity ward in Zhitomer, and uh, they also hit, started hitting churches. Uh, one of the principal churches in Kharkiv was hit today uh, with their windows uh, broken out by an explosion. All of this some amounts to crimes of war and crimes against humanity. This is very clear, and uh, uh, there will be trials in The Hague and beyond against every single uh, Russian who has committed crimes in the territory of Ukraine. And we will be pushing for reparations, but that will be then. Right now, our main task is to at least be able to survive as a nation and to be able to, uh, for our country to continue to exist as an independent country. We are doing the best we can against the biggest army in Europe and nuclear power and the third biggest army in the world. Uh, we are very grateful for all the help we are getting in ammunition and weapons, but this is not enough. 
Every day, Ukrainian children are dying. Uh, in big cities like Kharkiv and Kiev, which are being encircled, in small cities like Volnovakha, like uh, Nova Kahovka, uh, which are uh, and uh, which are being raised to the ground, basically. Irpin, Vucha, I can go on with the list. A colleague of mine uh, has his wife and his daughter trapped in a small village in Ukraine to which they moved out from Kiev because they thought they would be safe there. But no, now uh, the Russian soldiers are running rogue there and they are shooting at civilians. And, uh, and they are shooting at anything that moves. This is the situation we are in. Uh, we are all in fear of our lives. And most importantly, we are in fear of the lives of our children and of the children of Ukraine because they are the future of Ukraine. In order for us to keep standing, what do we need more? We need uh, the no-fly zone over Kiev and over the whole of Ukraine. And uh, my personal belief uh, is that it will actually uh, be for the safety of the whole Europe. Ukraine has five nuclear power stations, including Chernobyl. If Russian missiles hit one of those, that's it. We're looking at nuclear disaster and Putin doesn't even have to push that red button. And you know, with uh, how precise uh, Russian missiles are these days, I think that uh, this catastrophe can happen any moment unless there is a reaction, uh, a re reaction from NATO allies and there is a no-fly zone over Kyiv. This is something that we really need, and this is something that um, international politicians, European politicians, American politicians owe to their own people, to keep their own people safe, not just to keep Ukrainians safe. So please stop standing by and watching from the sidelines and making bets. Will Ukraine make it? Will it not? What about if we send them some more of those weapons? How about some more of these? This will never work. In the long term, in the long term, we need a stronger force to push back the Russians. Please do not wait until the number of civilian casualties goes beyond thousands uh, into millions. And please, please react now and uh, and please uh, act now and mobilize the forces, not just of your country but also of the other EU countries, so that we have a no-fly zone over Kyiv. This is really the one thing we ask for. And this is really the one thing that we need. So this is it from me. And Helena, uh, uh, I think uh, you have a lot to continue with. Uh, yeah. Well, um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, Aspen alumni, it's very weird to, uh, to participate in such an Aspen event. But uh, thank you for actually for organizing such an event. I don't have that much time either because all the members of parliament and all active citizens are now like doing something constantly. Uh, I, I just want to tell you that uh, I don't have that much uh, to add to what Lisa did. Uh, I am actually uh, proud of Lisa because she, uh, she is talking about it being so calm, but actually we are not calm because we are under constant shelling. Uh, I live on outskirts of Kyiv, and uh, this morning I nearly fell down from my uh, from my uh, bed, like very early morning, because Russian rocket, Russian missile, uh, hit the house uh, in like I don't know, hundred meters from my house, and this is outskirts. There, there are no uh, military uh, points, no TV station that they claim to attack. They are killing civilians and uh, uh, the number of victims already went beyond uh, thousands. Uh, what should I add? Uh, I, I also ask you to actually uh, start being active, even more active uh, um, uh, than, uh, than you are because uh, the situation, uh, it's really hard to assess whether the situation for Ukraine is becoming better or worse because on one side uh, this is true that uh, uh, Russian uh, troops are now hungry and demoralized. They thought they will take over our country in one day, maximum three days. They thought that it will be a total invasion and they will pretty much like take over our country. Uh, they did not accept that uh, we will resist, but this is our land, this is our cities, this is our family, so, so we protect ourselves. Uh, so on one, uh, on one hand, uh, they uh, do, they, uh, Russian troops are, uh, are hungry, they are tired, they are demoralized, uh, but on another hand, we see that Putin is going absolutely crazy, 
and he starts using more and more dangerous weapon, including weapon of uh, massive destruction, and he puts it. Uh, he puts it. Uh, uh, against uh, uh, cities and villages and towns in Ukraine. As Lesia said, uh, the majority of uh, cities and towns, and by, 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 by towns I mean like uh, with population of 50,000 people in it, majority of uh, such towns around Ukraine are on fire. Uh, the number of uh, residential blocks are ruined because uh, Putin and the Russian occupation troops are trying to take over Kyiv. So this is really, uh, this is a nightmare that we are going through. And this is uh, actually horrible that it takes place in Europe. And the, the scale is really uh, horrifying. This is World War II in Ukraine. We experienced the same thing that, that Europe experienced uh, uh, in uh, during the World War II again, but uh, this is not acceptable to to have it now when you know when there is all these organizations, uh, international organizations for peace, for like uh, protection and stuff like that. Uh, let's uh, probably uh, sum it up uh, with uh, once again what are the biggest needs of Ukraine now? The number one is a no-fly zone. And uh, we are, I should say that we are a little bit disappointed that uh, unfortunately leadership of uh, many Western countries are afraid to provide this uh, hand of help, the most important ha hand of help now. And uh, that is why hundreds of uh, civilians uh, keep uh, being uh, murdered. But no-fly zone is definitely number one. Uh, regarding the other uh, needs uh, we need, I can add three. Uh, first uh, is um, is weapon actually because we have mobilized a number of people a number of people including men and women and even elderly people they uh, volunteered to go to um, defense to territory defense uh, to help army we gave away all uh, helmets and body armor we had and we elected them so uh, all kinds of weapon the most important are anti-air weapon, uh, air, air and land air, like, uh, I don't know, uh, how do you call them? Uh, javelins, uh, stingers and stuff like that. And this is not time to, you know, to sit in your house and being afraid. This is time to actually uh, be active. Also in terms of so-called humanitarian help, we need uh, bulletproof uh, helmets and body armor, A big number of it, <laughs> everything you have, please uh, collect and send. Uh, hopefully, if we, uh, if we uh, fight back Russia, you won't need your bulletproof helmets and body armors. But, uh, but Ukrainian guys need it in order not to be murdered uh, by, by Russian bullets. So this is about weapon. Uh, anti missiles weapon, uh, bodyproof helmets, and uh, uh, bulletproof helmets and armor. Uh, second thing is uh, economic sanctions against Russia. Uh, as far as we know, the, the sanctions were uh, imposed only partly uh, regarding uh, blocking Russia from SWIFT, which was our main plea. As far as we know, uh, only part of the Russian banks were blocked from SWIFT. Sberbank, which is the biggest uh, Russian bank, which is state Russian bank, this is half of uh, all the wires uh, in Russia. Sberbank is working and, you know, fills itself quite well. So this is very important to block the whole Russia from SWIFT. Definitely Sberbank not even discussed. Uh, economic sanctions is number two. And the third thing uh, we really need, like, given the, given the fact that uh, we are using all our resources, everything we have and everything we don't even have to, uh, to protect the country and protect actually the border of Europe. And, uh, and the scale is uh, really uh, impressive. Just, just for you to once again realize like what we are going through. This is uh, realize the scale of Ukrainian heroism, Russia and yellow Ukraine. And we fight back Russians, we, we fight back for Ukraine and we fight back for, for Europe. So we also need financial aid. Uh, 
if you uh, are able to like persist your government to provide additional uh, additional financial aid and additional wire this is exactly the time to do it and uh, i agree with lisa i'm joining lisa with your uh, with your appeal that it's actually time to to start being really active and to take actions if there are people who uh, uh, in germany and in other countries uh, who don't feel like that they have a voice ask them to go to street rallies to persuade uh, their government because uh, this is really this is really the nightmare we are going through and we really need a, a need a, we, we need a hand of help from uh, from europeans european friends nowadays a lot of europeans are saying that they worry for ukraine that they pray for ukraine but uh, the prayers are not working anymore uh, our people are dying our people are keeping uh, being murdered so it's time to stop praying and to start doing uh, some actions. Uh, street rallies to persuade your government to act. Uh, uh, weapon uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, body armors and helmets. Uh, second, blocking Russia from SWIFT totally. Sberbank for sure. And third, financial aids and tranches. Also, National Bank of Ukraine have opened uh, accounts where anyone any citizen uh, around the world, any company around the world, uh, anyone can uh, donate their own private uh, private money. I will send you this information, and uh, Les and I will be thankful if you can share uh, this bank accounts information as well. So any citizen can can do a small, a big donation, but can actually participate in in this uh, horrible war. That, uh, that Russia started against Ukraine. So you can participate on the side of, how do you call it, white side, the, the true side. Thank you so very much. If you send that to us, um, we are happy to post it um, immediately also in the, in the chat function. I don't know um, how long you two actually um, can stay. Um, I see that Liza has already um, left us. No, I didn't leave. I'm no, just looking you, for the, yeah. I just want to send you the, the bank details immediately so that you have it and you, it doesn't get lost. Guys, what I suggest is that uh, can we do uh, can we do quick questions and answers? There's a couple in the chat. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, how much do you believe the United sanctions of countries all around the world really help the Ukrainian citizens and Ukraine in the war? Uh, yes, they do help. And these United sanctions will have a long-term effect. Sure. They already have an effect and we are extremely grateful for that and what uh, Helena just said is that we need to extend them even further the SWIFT all of the Russian banks must be switched off from the SWIFT because legally they found uh, a KVAD how to go around uh, the sanctions and they are feeling very happy and very comfortable so please you started really really well just to take it to the end because uh, if Russia is allowed to keep standing if business with Russia continues as usual if you continue to buy their oil and gas uh, if you continue to, to trade with them, all of that goes into their budget and then it goes into their army, which is now killing, not, no, not killing, sorry, massacring Ukrainians, the whole of the Ukrainian people in a uh, very close form to genocide. Uh, so please stop all economic encounters and trade with Russia. This is another appeal to, to all of you. And I believe that this is possible. There are enough markets out there uh, that allow you to deal uh, with uh, in a manner that is uh, that will leave your conscious sleeping calmly uh, and not disturbing you all the time. Uh, as for Russian oil and gas, that's another very valid point. Uh, what we don't understand here in Ukraine is how is it that Germany declares itself um, the greenest country uh, in Europe and says that you're uh, uh, your government says that you're going to go uh, carbon neutral by 2050 and even uh, earlier than that and that you're turning to greens and you're still doing oil and gas stuff with Russia. Come on, guys. I think uh, I think uh, that there needs to be uh, sort of like a very uh, sustainable policy in place, not uh, uh, kind of 50-50, a bit of lip service here, a bit of uh, Russian oil, Russian gas there. Uh, although we are very proud of you and very grateful for you that finally 
your government has abandoned all the dreams of this uh, not Nord Stream 2 nonsense. Um, so no fly enforced by NATO member states. Uh, da, 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 da. The risk of NATO attacking Russian forces in Ukraine in the no-fly zone would escalate the conflict. Germany has authorized 2,000 uh, and, uh, into Ukraine. Okay, so we are very uh, help. Uh, we are aware of everything Germany is sending us, Halle, especially because Halina is actually the friendship, group, the chair of the friendship group with Germany. Uh, so uh, she she knows more than anyone of what is actually being sent into uh, into Ukraine from Germany and what we are saying is that we're grateful and we need to keep it coming and to keep it going for the no-fly zone and for enforced by nato members uh look my opinion is that uh nato allies uh and uh nato members are already in war with russia because of all the sanctions that you introduced against russia and putin you're already in the blacklist and you're already listed as enemies in their defense and security strategy. Uh, whether you help Ukraine now or you do not help Ukraine now, Putin already has enough excuses to wage war against you. You have to understand that Putin's army, although it's super huge, it's not sophisticated. When uh, we um, capture Russian uh, tanks and Russian armored vehicles, uh, what our army sees is that it's in a worse condition than uh, anything that we had even in, in the 2012 uh, period, like before, before this war started. Um, they do not have the resource to attack any NATO country because they understand that if they attack a NATO country, they will have all the NATO countries full forces against Russia and they cannot spare that. Plus, they are not interested in that. Putin's only goal is to uh, erase Ukraine off the face of the earth. That's it, he will stop at that. He is mad, he is completely mad. The only thing that you can do uh, really uh, when you introduce the no-fly zone is uh, save Ukrainians from uh, being erased and eradicated by uh, Russians. We are talking about people's lives, we are talking about children's lives, we are talking about um, a, a heritage, a human heritage and the cultural heritage. And we're talking also about the nuclear security of all the people in Europe. So with that, again, I literally uh, both myself and Helena, both myself and Helena, we are begging you, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely begging you to uh, take this risk. We understand it's a risk. We understand it's not the popular decision, but we are begging you because Ukrainians are dying. Uh, and the toll is just growing every single day. And the way that they are, uh, you know, um, waging this war against us, the way they are doing this is we know it from our intelligence. They are targeting women and children. And we are begging you, please save Ukraine and help us do the snow fly zone. He is not going to go into NATO because he has no resource to go into NATO. He can intensify his actions against Ukraine. Yes, he can. But if we will have the support of NATO allies here in our skies, first of all, in our skies, then uh, there is uh, enough to prevent us from being destroyed completely. And if he is being pushed back like any bully, he will have to retreat and push back, especially with all the economic sanctions in place. But it's uh, growing harder and harder for us every day to, uh, to uh, keep the skies protected. And every um, building that is being hit is because the Ukrainian anti-air strike system is being stretched so thin. The air jets have still not arrived. So we have issue with that as well. And this is another reason why we are really asking you, we understand that you, you fear the risk of war. He is not able, it is one country. He does not have allies. He does not have strong allies who can actually come in and sign up to a war with all of you. And he, there's no way he will stretch himself thin and wager a war against Germany or the UK or the US. So please consider that and have debates around that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. And um, I will not open it uh, for all our participants quite yet, because we do need to hear from Robin uh, Wagner 
Robin, you have just been appointed the chair, chairman um, of the German Ukrainian parliamentarian group. Um, and I would love to give you the word um, to also reply to what you just heard before I then um, hand over to Metin Hagverdi. Yeah, thank you for the floor. And it's, it's really a horrible situation to, um, yeah, actually to just being appointed as, as chair of the friendship group and uh, getting to know my colleague from Ukraine in, in such a horrible situation. I'm, I'm really glad to hear your voices and see your faces here. And um, also, it's, it's, I think it's very important to have the authentic uh, Ukrainian voices here in the German discussion as well. We had the, the messages on, on Sunday when we had the special meeting of the German Bundestag, we received some messages from members of parliament before via Twitter. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for these uh, voices um, articulating the, the situation and the demands and things like that. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, and still, it's, it's so horrible to hear it and um, to always think about what we can do, what are our possibilities. And I'm really glad at the moment that the German government has uh, adjusted the position on the issue of, of arms deliveries, um, which was a very, very big decision, actually coming also coming from the Green Party. And, and it's the same, will be the same for social democrats and, and others in Germany for the whole um, society. I think it was a big swift imposition and I'm, I'm really glad we finally made it. It's the right thing to do and uh, it was right to try to prevent war by diplomatic means but um, it's also true that diplomacy must be backed up by military means and uh, right now we are we have to talk about military means uh, actually and that is what germany is doing at the moment and today we had uh, new arms deliveries uh, being approved by the vice chancellor and also that was really the right thing to do i would concerning what we can do actually in the in the next Next time, what we can do, I would like to draw attention to the motion passed by the Bundestag on Sunday, which was uh, not only um, saying that uh, Germany stands firmly by the side of our Ukrainian friends and that we value the same values of, of democracy, freedom and peace and, and the European goal. Uh, we also called on the federal government to provide Ukraine with all political, economical, financial and humanitar humanitarian support. And um, to continually adapt the sanctions. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm really convinced that uh, supporting Ukraine with financial support must definitely also mean uh, supporting Ukraine with generous and enough financial support to be able to, uh, to buy weapons themselves and, and to even get more than we can deliver. Uh, that is something that, that has to be read from this um, from, from this decision of the German Bundestag to provide financial support and all the other things definitely have to increase, um, which is medicine, weapons, food, fuel, protective equipment. We heard about protective equipment before. Um, we, we do what we do at the moment, but this is not enough. We have to do more of this. And uh, I think we are steadily increasing this. Uh, and also um, concerning the sanctions, personally, I think we should think about um, temporarily oil embargo, for example, um, and, and other measures that directly hit Russia's capability of uh, financing the war. Um, and that is what we have to do at the moment. I'm, I'm very concerned about, I, I do hear the voices uh, for no fly zones and, and things like that. And, and my, actually I have to admit my stomach tells me to do things like that, but then, um, with a calm mind, I'm, I'm really, really worried about um, a very broad escalation of the conflict um, to a, a whole world conflict and uh, nuclear escalations and things like that, which, which is definitely a problem when we... Um, what do you mean by nuclear? Forces, uh, what uh, what so do you mean by nuclear escalation? The fact that uh, Putin will, will use nuclear weapons? Actually, I do not know what Putin will be doing, but that is uh, definitely something that is in the, in the scope of possibilities. I don't think it is what will the happen, fact, but it's, it's, it, it may fact, be a problem. Yes, the fact is that he already declared three days ago that he plans to use nuclear weapon against uh, Ukraine. And if he does so, you will have consequences as well. Because it's not like we are all living in, on European continent. 
So, uh, in my opinion, this is actually not, uh, you know, not a moment to, to think about like uh, whether you worry, what can be the escalation. I think the situation is already escalated to the top. There is no, like, you can only hit the ceiling to, to break the top. This is already the full scale war on European continent, a war that is uh, killing thousands of civilians. This is already here. It's not like, you know, uh, a lot of room for democracy, a lot of room for diplomacy and stuff of uh, stuff like that. We are sending our guys to diplomatic negotiations to, to Belarus, despite the fact that uh, Russian missiles are coming from Belarus land. But we are risking uh, the head of parliamentary majority, who is the head of uh, diplomacy negotiation group. And he comes back and says, it's, it's nothing. This negotiation doesn't give anything. Uh, so, uh, and uh, once again, let's listen to Lesia. We have five huge nuclear stations in Ukraine. If not even a nuclear power will be used against uh, Ukraine, but uh, a missiles that they are using massively, if any of this nuclear station will be hit, you will have, it's not only in Ukraine, you will have the consequ consequences of ecological man-made catastrophic as well. Secondly, uh, you probably heard that uh, Russian occupation troops have captured the uh, Chernobyl zone. Mm -hmm. Have you? Yeah, so yeah. Chernobyl, where we have an active nuclear station, one, one of them, and also a huge, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, sarco sarcophag on, on another part. Russian mm -hmm. troops with their tanks and with, with their muzzles are there, and they are messing with their weapon hardly. So they can, uh, they can like do something with Chernobyl as well. And eco ecological catastrophic will cause not only Ukraine. So this is not the time, you know, to think about what might happen, what might not happen. This is time to act actually. Yeah, but Robin, it has been a huge step for your party, which you already, I mean, which, which you went over the last couple of days and hours, right? And you're, currently still discussing what needs to be done, correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was a huge step. And, and personally, I think we need to do more and, and uh, take further steps. Of course, we, we need to do. That's what I said. Mm. Then let's also hear from Metin. Um, we can't hear you, Metin. Excuse me. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, perfect. This uh, a serious and um, it's also a depressing situation um, because of the victims right now, but also what we've seen before this conflict escalated uh, last week. And obviously everybody, um, everybody's asking themselves um, if there was anything we could do before to prevent this from happening. Um, this uh, question will not be answered, but um, obviously we are, um, psychologically in this situation of, of asking ourselves and feeling guilty about the situation. Right now, there has been a, a big political swift within the German society uh, for very good reasons, um, with the decision to uh, deliver arms. And as you probably read, um, that this will continue from German soul being delivered arms and uh, support for other arms delivery of our uh, allies uh, in Europe. Um, financial uh, support and, uh, of course, the very strong sanctions is a, a means of um, a mixture of uh, preemptive um, sanctions, but also a, also a punishment of what already happened. Um, the sanctions, as I see it today, um, will have severe impact on the Russian economy generally and on uh, on uh, the elites of the Russian system, but also uh, the, the broader population that will put a, hopefully a super big pressure on Mr. Putin to take all measures um, to, to end this aggression because there is no alternative for him left that this will work out for any winning situation for him. Um, at this point, uh, the defense, um, defensive actions of the Ukraine army and, and the Ukrainian, Ukrainian people um, were surprising, not only for us in the West, um, but also for Mr. Putin, obviously. 
and we have to use this opportunity now that the brave fight of the Ukrainians uh, gave us to have this window of opportunity to use it to put even more pressure on Mr. Putin by further arm deliveries and further sanctions to, to keep the pressure so high that there will be, no matter what his alternative mindset might be, which is very, very difficult to analyze at this point, but even if, if there are just crazy alternatives on his mind that they will, will be fading to zero. So, um, so this aggression might end in the near future and that um, with the willing of the Ukrainian government, um, some sort of negotiations could be, could be started, uh, real negotiations um, towards an end of the use of military force. Lisa, I would like to hand back uh, to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, if there is actually, what, what, what kind of scenarios are we facing? And what could be the best one we can reach in a short amount of time? Lisa, are you still with us? I think she has, um, um, this is what she, she warned us about, um, that her time is very short um, and that she might have to sign um, off very quickly. Um, may I? Uh, yeah, have, colleagues, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I need to leave too. I just wanted to say bye-bye. I wanted to say uh, thanks to uh, all the brave uh, Europeans who are standing next to Ukraine and who are helping. Uh, thank you uh, for those who still have, you know, some thoughts here and thoughts there. Please don't hesitate. It's time to to provide this hand of help for the country in order to avoid this uh, massive aggression on the European continent. It's now about European continent. So uh, thank you. Keep in touch. Thank you so much for joining us, and and really our hearts are with you and. Um, and thank you so much for doing this uh, today while we know that you are under enormous, enormous, enormous stress and angst. Um, we are with you um, and we definitely will keep in touch. Thank you so much um, and give our best to Liza. Um, I have to say that this is, um, this is very moving um, for me and I don't know how you feel. Um, I feel very, very shaken and it's hard to discuss that topic. Um, the question which I just raised with regards to scenarios and what could be best um, or worst case scenarios and what we can do to achieve a best case and avoid a uh, worst case, this is something before I open it up for overall discussion, which I want to ask to J.D. Bindernagel, um, because I know um, as former um, U.S. ambassador to Germany, but also as a professor, um, and you have been working on strategic and, uh, and um, strategic foresight. Um, JD, can I uh, briefly hand over to you? Yes, please, uh, thank you. And I, I too uh, share the emotional uh, upsets that we are now experiencing, and I cannot imagine what's happening in, in Ukraine. But <clears throat> taking back uh, the multifaceted way of dealing with this, I, I hinted, first of all, we are not yet at a point where we have a conf conflict escalated between NATO and Russia. <clears throat> that is something that Mr. Biden has been very clear about, and we should be very worried about it because uh, if Putin has no alternative, he may just as well <clears throat> try to use the same false arguments <clears throat> that he's doing with Ukraine with the Baltics. And I'd be very concerned that, uh, that we need to have a stronger military presence in the Baltics and in Poland right now. And we are moving that way with, <clears throat> with the rapid reaction force. But thinking of it in, as, as a diplomat for a moment, we really need to think about what we can do uh, for, <clears throat> for negotiations to support these negotiations that Zelensky has been willing to talk. And then the key of course is, is on, on a ceasefire. That's, that's the first thing we need to do. And maybe it may be even possible because Putin has overestimated what he can do and he doesn't have any, any alternatives, there's a, a ceasefire would offer an opportunity to step back. 
We would also, we need to continue to ratchet up the, the, the sanctions on, on the military. That is to say, make sure that they understand that they are liable for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And they too will be personally be held responsible because that will put hopefully some pressure on, on the military to intervene with Mr. Putin, either to for, get a ceasefire or to remove him. The same can be said for the oligarchs. I'm told that the oligarchs were invited to a bunker uh, by Mr. Putin so that they wouldn't flee. So if they have, they have uh, others have a stake here at Putin's war. And by the way, words count. And I would argue that what uh, Chancellor Schultz said on Sunday is the vocabulary that we should be using about discussing this. This is Putin's war. The more you can put it on Putin and Putin's war, the more you separate it out from the Russians. I don't think that he has his population behind him, but it's really very important to make sure that there's that differentiation. Uh, we have a, a statement that will be coming out from the <clears throat> Russia NATO dialogue. These are pr primarily retired military people from NATO and from, <clears throat> and from Russia. We've been uh, having this discussion for two years and we've just uh, agreed in a statement. I don't really like it, but it's but what we could achieve and that is calling for a ceasefire, calling for an immediate ceasefire. And this is coming from Russians, senior, former senior uh, people from the Russian Academy of Sciences and Americans and Germans and Brits particularly and some other East Central Europeans. We need to focus politically on the ceasefire we need to focus politically on the people that have some influence with Putin, that is the military and the oligarchs, and for the rest, and particularly the Greens and others who work with civil society, keep those channels open to the Russian people. Keep, keep Twitter and, and all the social media contacts, let them know what's going on in, in, in the Ukraine because they, they too are affected. They would need to have an explanation why they can't get money from the bank, why they can't travel. And, and we can have a voice in doing that. So those are the three things that I think we can do. In addition to what we need to do as governments, that is we need to deal with the no-fly zone issue by providing not only the old GDR anti-aircraft batteries, but anything that we can to clarify, to clear the skies. They have a right under Article 51 of the UN Charter for self-defense. There is no real argument politically or legally that you cannot help them do this without risking a NATO action. There's, there's a lot of things that we can, we can do ahead of that. So let me just stop there. Thank you very much. Um, I do have on my list um, August von Joost and then also Ralf Lang. Before I hand over to August uh, von Joost, I briefly also want to bring in you, Carsten Vogt, um, because you have been thinking um, about Russia and had been involved in Russia relations for a very, very, very long time. And uh, we would love to hear your insights as well. We can't hear you yet. <laughs> I'm not going to remind you of a minor issue which is indirectly related to Ukraine, where a new crisis might evolve, that's Moldova. Moldova is not a member of NATO, it has been part of the Soviet Union. And so far, all the ideology which is expressed by uh, Putin is also endangering Moldova. And there, we should think about how, in a preventive way, we can help this country, which is not a member of an alliance, and where the war has not started yet. So it's only a side remark, but not totally unimportant side remark. I think that um, Putin has miscalculated the whole affair. He has underestimated the direction of the risk, and he has overestimated the efficiency of his armed forces. Uh, but I fear that he is uh, it's very difficult to influence his calculation because most of the economic circles in Russia were against the war and they, um, and they really didn't get the influence. So the real point is where I, in purely military terms, the no-flight zone is a legitimate demand 
from the Ukrainian side. I am not sure whether NATO will take that risk, including the Americans. It's not a, because the major risk would then be taken by the Americans because they have to fear the nuclear escalation most in a certain way because they are the nuclear power and not we are the nuclear power. So this no-fly zone is, is uh, I, my analysis is that the United States will not be ready to implement a no-fly zone and uh, because it, it is combined with facts this promise to the American people not to be drawn into a war between NATO and, the, and, uh, and uh, Russia. That we, if we do, what we should do is be more efficient in, with the supply of anti-tech weapons and uh, anti-air uh, uh, weapons. Uh, I, I was not sure whether we would got, uh, take that step but that step in direction of increasing your defense capabilities is, uh, I think, the most important one. Uh, what I uh, think that I, I cannot calculate whether Putin, I mean, his instincts will go not to have a soft landing. This is not his type. His type is to, have, once the war has started, you go massive into the war. And this phase has now started. And how much he is willing, I mean, how much he is willing to take the, the cost in human lives and economy, I simply can't say it. And therefore, I am not capable of making scenarios. The negotiations which take place between Ukrainians and, uh, and Russians at this stage are not serious. They only start to be serious once Russia is thinking that it cannot implement all its war goals. So the calculation, and they can only be influenced by military means and not by only by diplomatic means. Thank you uh, very much uh, for these insights. Um, I now hand over to August von Just and then Ralf Lange, and then back to Metin and Robin. We can't hear you yet. We still can't hear you. Try again. Okay, now you can hear me. Yeah, now we well, can. I think we have heard a very impressive statement by those two ladies, which is heartbreaking and true and fully understandable of their position. I think we hear every day from morning to evening what is going on in Ukraine, and I think we all realize the same. There's a war. But that's, I'd like to put things a bit into perspective. Germany and NATO has reacted for their usual speed, capabilities, and politics, and whatever you call it, very fast. Uh, they keep delivering equipment, valuable equipment to the Ukraine, which is good, especially the anti-tank missiles, which is the most needed stuff for the time being. Ground to air missiles, I doubt, but anti-tank missiles is really needed. And I understand that some of the stuff has only arrived, arrived there. So I must say, what I think we should all concentrate on all our levels is how can we get humanitarian help moving? I know the Red Cross, the Maltese, the St. John's, they're all active there. I'm in contact with them. Uh, but I think the humanitarian matter is a real matter, a matter of picking up people here when they come here, making them feel at home. That's something very important. Um, we are, I've, I've said the arms delivery is moving. I doubt having been in the defense industry for 20 years and having been in active war in Vietnam for 18 months or 73, 74, uh, I doubt whether, whether we can rev up Ukraine from yesterday to tomorrow on a standard that we have in Germany or in NATO. We can only try to help to prevent the inevitable respectively to hold it up as long as possible. Oil and gas, I think we are at our limits because we still have to heat a little bit and uh, it'll be uh, certainly explainable that people have to turn down temperature, but I think a lot of things is, is being done there. What I'm missing is the following. My good friend Wolfgang Ischinger said the other day, does anybody has a recipe to get Putin up the tree where he has put himself on? And that's the problem. I think that a real dialogue with Putin is virtually impossible for the time. He sits in a corner or he sits on a tree, self-chosen by him, 
And I think this is the toughest task to try not to crack, is how to get with arguments to Putin. Taking properties of the oligarch is a fantastic move and a swift move. And I'm hearing the outcry already from my friends from the Côte d'Azur and out of London and banking London, what's going on there. And if I miss Abramovich doesn't only want to sell his football club, but his residences in England, this is for a final move to Abu Dhabi and Dubai. This is a real threat to put in if all the oligarchs are being treated like that, like that. Most of the ships are at the Maldives, we know this but some of them are kept and that Putin was able three weeks ago to get his private yard out of Hamburg is a miracle but it happened. Nevertheless this must be followed on further and anything what can be produced to apply personal pressure on Putin to discredit him, uh, to make him suffer, to make him understand how much the world is against him and he certainly lives in a cocoon around himself with his people and I don't think everybody who wants to see him so it becomes, and this is important for myself. I think the whole thing cooks down to diplomacy, even if it looks in, in vain for the time being with between Russia and, and Ukraine, to keep the door open and talk. And anything else we have to do, we have to try any way, any way to get close with harm actions, close to Putin's environment, so that the outcry cannot be anymore overheard. A war between you, you, uh, NATO and Russia is unthinkable and non-acceptable. I doubt whether Putin is going for a uh, nuclear strike. Uh, I think there will be forces in the country which will prevent this. I hear from my sources and uh, investment, which I have, that uh, there's this increasing unrest in the military forces and the upper echelons in the military forces and the lowers anyhow about this. And when one looks very carefully at the TV spot where Putin says, and he's signing the up, uh, upgrading on nuclear alert, and looks at the two guys sitting there, and if you to cut out those images and to enlarge them and put them in front of a psychological analyzer, or a, what you call a profile, you clearly see unbelief, anger, fear, anything in there, but not certainly 100% trust. And I think this is something where we have to keep working for all levels. Plant that fear, that mistrust, all this, into the people who are around him and to make him understand that, that he might climb down to the tree on the tree and uh, stop things. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, over to Ralf Lange and then Catherine and then Klaus. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon and an excellent uh, session here. Good, an excellent insight. Um, my question is, I think we all have really trouble to get in the brain from Mr. Putin. I think any rational is gone how to judge him, how he will react. I just read from time to time on Twitter that he has recent telephone calls directly with Macron. And I read that also he might have called today or Macron. My question is, is, what is the communication currently going on directly between the leaders in Europe? Thank you so much. Um, I also would like to ask all our participants um, who haven't uh, turned on their camera to please do so. Um, it's so much better to actually see you um, instead of talking into a void. And also, um, because I'm uh, having the um, taking a look at the time, if you want to participate, it's time now to raise your hand. Um, I don't want to see 50 hands going up five minutes before we have to end. So over to Catherine. Yes, I, I'm now in my house in the Cote d'Azur and Putin has a house on the hill behind me, just, just so you know. And I hope they take it from him. I have oligarchs all around me. And I must say the oligarch right next door had a party yesterday where there were a lot of drunken men there screaming and yelling all afternoon and evening. So I don't know what they had to celebrate, but that's beside the point. I just want to say I have two ideas. I don't know if um, you guys might know the answer to this. I think to get at Putin, get, it, get him really bad, is that we could get him out of the Security Council. Um, they were having the revolving Monat Leisha, so uh, uh, turn that ended the last day of February. And now it's um, Abu Dhabi is there now, the uh, Fawa A. Um, I think if we could get him out of there, it would really, really be a shame for him. I don't know if that is possible. 
but the word security, I mean, just that makes it a farce to have this country sitting on there with so much power. The second thing I wanna say is we could do, and I don't know if it's already been done, he should be put on that list for the Hague, that he is one of those um, people that are hunted, like Karachik was hunted in Milosevic. He should be hunted down and taken to the Hague. It doesn't matter if you're a head of state, you can still be taken to the Hague. Mm -hmm. And I think he should be put straight on that list, on the wanted list. Do you know, there is one oligarch that has put a bounty on his head now, but it's only 1 million euros. Um, I, I think that if the other oligarchs were serious, they would up that ante and make it a, a higher bounty. But that's all I have to say. Those are just two ideas I have. Thank you so much, Catherine. And um, Klaus, when you uh, share your insights, maybe you can also say something on the uh, Security Council. Uh, I am not sure whether, whether uh, exclusion from the Security uh, Council is a, is a, a viable uh, uh, or even legally possibly possible op option. And uh, on what somebody else said, uh, said uh, about uh, Macron, I just heard at the European Leadership Network um, that he has uh, had nine phone calls with uh, Putin in the last days and that he is totally without hope, P uh, Macron that is. I'm sorry I missed uh, part of the session because in parallel we had a meeting of the European Leadership uh, Network uh, where Sir Adam Thompson was extremely interested to find options for diplomacy. And uh, I said uh, that I think uh, the prospect of uh, diplomacy is uh, very slim and with a gun to your temple, negotiations have no good prospect and short of Putin's conditions, which we all know he will not agree to a ceasefire. Uh, Pressure must at least aim at preventing that Kiev and Kharkiv are turned into places like Grozny and Aleppo, but I think it is already coming. And uh, my, what, I, what I pointed out uh, is uh, I would like to share with you, diplomacy with a regime that has lied to everybody for a long time is also problematic. But for the time being, the effort must be to make the Putin regime ready for diplomacy through sanctions aimed at driving the clique around Putin apart and also the Russian people apart from Putin, information of the Russian people on all channels, much stronger naming and shaming, isolation from the civilized world, uh, see the UN General Assembly, and strengthening Ukrainian resistance on all counts. And I must say, I'm so happy that the German government got at last around to its decision about the, the weapon um, um, deliveries. Uh, last uh, Thursday afternoon on Welt TV, I, I spent five minutes trying to uh, counter all the uh, arguments which the government and several politicians have uh, voiced against uh, helping the Ukrainian resistance with arms. And now thousands of uh, of stingers and other uh, uh, anti-air rockets and uh, and uh, anti-armor uh, weapons. That's exactly what they need. But in that context, uh, context uh, it is terrible to say, <laughs> not least as a Christian, as many as possible fallen soldiers are needed to get the Russian people and the circle around Putin to understand what is happening and to rise up against the war. That is what Putin fears. You may have heard about the um, rumors about the mobile crematorium. Somebody said to me that is to save zinc coffins. No, I said it is to hide the rising number of fallen soldiers from the Russian people and from the uh, soldiers, mothers organization, etc., etc. And on a discussion the other day, somebody explained how Putin rules by fear. And I said, yes, but he also rules from fear, not from not of NATO, but of his own uh, people, and I think uh, the psychological things need to be uh, to figure to 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 uh, come into our um, our uh, our uh, considerations and uh, 
uh, one must be aware what he calls security interests vis-a-vis -a, -vis a totally uh, defensive NATO are for the most uh, part what I call in German politisch psychologische Befindlichkeiten, sensitivities, and his own, own interest, his sole real interest is to keep the democratic virus away from the Russian borders. And if we make compromises on Ukraine, talking about it like it is an object between East and West, and we would give in, then he would, uh, then he would uh, uh, occupy Ukraine. But then again, he would have democratic neighbors and he would not stop at Ukraine. That is what I said, and I just wanted to repeat it here. Thank you so much, uh, Klaus. Um, before we do a second round um, of questions and comments, I would like to hand back to Mitin and Robin um, for some intervening um, impressions and remarks to what you just heard. Um, Mitin? Tommy, thank you again for putting this round together because it's, um, it's <laughs> useful just to listen <laughs> to the folks participating. So thank you to everybody. Um, as I understood the, the change of, um, of mindset since at least Sunday, probably since, uh, since Thursday last week, um, make no mistake, we will put a lot more pressure on this regime in Moscow if this war continues. Um, if at this point we don't really know in detail how the sanctions will work out in, in what time spent on, on, on each individual in the Russian Federation, but they will be pretty severe, um, as I would think, and we are willing to, to intensify them. Um, the German um, government is considering and would be supported by the coalition um, to consider not to be cut off uh, of gas delivery of the Russian Federation, but to cut them off by, them, by ourselves uh, to take the last step to put the pressure on, on the system itself. The biggest problem remains. It is the reasoning and the decision-making process with Mr. Putin. Um, and this is actually the reason why I would strongly oppose, um, I would say at this time, um, because I'm impressed of, by the developments of the last eight days, like, like most people. But, but at this time, I'm very convinced of that I would strongly oppose any action that could be understood as a entering of NATO on the battlefield of Ukraine against Russian forces. And there are, of course, two aspects to that. One is um, the legal aspect um, of the limits of self-defense, but more, more important is the, the factual influence on, on the cause of war, but also the perspective of Europe to building up at some day, far from today, a new kind of security order with or without Mr. Putin, with or without the 10 other guys in the Kremlin today, with or without um, uh, governments in, in place now in Germany and France and Spain and Poland. But obviously the perspective of our continent is not to rage in war for the next decades to come between two blocks. So we need this, the, the most frustrating for us Europeans outside Ukraine, because obviously for the Ukrainian people, this is uncomparable un to anybody else. But to us is that our perspective of having a, a, a peaceful sort of by legal and historian lines system of a minimum a minimum of trust and confidence in a peaceful future was just destroyed and we have to rebuild it basically at this point on distrust it sounds almost impossible so we have to take into account also that there is a future after this conflict um, that makes it even more difficult at this point 
Um, I'm not sure what, how to approach Mr. Putin at this point. If we should send him to, to the International Court of Justice to punish him, his family, everybody around him and telling him now that we will do it, gathering evidence like we did in Syria and uh, setting in a prosecutor today in Berlin, who will do that starting today, gathering evidence to put him to jail? I asked myself, and I'm, I don't have an opinion yet on this one, but I'm asking myself whether that would um, be, a, would bring an advantage for us to build up a future security system faster and end the war quicker. The big difference could be, could be uh, compared to war criminals, let's say in, in the Western Balkans, that the Russian Federation, if we like it or not, is a nuclear weapons state um, with a super intransparent chain of command, which we know a lot about, but we haven't understood stood it in detail um, and while the, the Ukrainian people is fighting, it is very, very difficult not to, to rage in anger um, about this Russian decision by Mr. Putin. But we have to think about the future of this continent. This is not the first war this continent faces and we, we have to do everything we can that that there's a, at least a chance it's, it's the last one of, of that size. Um, and I am, I'm assuming there will be a point in history where we have to make very practical decisions on ending killing. And I assume there will be another point in history where we will we'll have a legitimate, legal, moral, and political analysis that could also lead to formal legal processes and maybe economic processes as well, as well. But those two moments in history might not be happening at the same time. Thank you so much, uh, Metin. Um, because time is running out, uh, Robin, would it be okay if we um, take the last three questions on board and then I hand over to you? Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, so um, the next on my list is um, Imre. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. I have a question for the two German parliamentarians um, and I'm gonna keep it short and brief. Um, I have to say I'm astounded by a lot of what you've both said today because it's been your parties for the past few years who have been gaslighting every German expert, every Eastern European and every Ukrainian who have been warning about this. And I'm also very concerned because I watched Scholz's speech in the Bundestag and the reception to the strategic shift wasn't exactly complete among the ranks of the SPD and the Greens. And even if we try, or have in the past, tried to understand the Russian perspective, and believe me, even as a Hungarian, I have tried, especially in a discussion with, a, in many discussions with a very dear friend of mine. I saw that speech last Tuesday, and I saw that all of this was never about NATO, never about the EU, never about supposed Russian security interests, it was, this is about one thing, empire. I need to ask. And the thing, yeah, yeah. How are you two going to make sure that the SPD and the Greens actually implement this strategic shift? Because right now I'm skeptical that it will actually happen. Thank you so much. Um, over to Martin. Martin, sorry. <laughs> um, well, it's Martin, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Martin is a boy's name. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> so I have a question um, to all the people attending uh, the session. I am facing um, an issue within my, my, my profession, and I'm, I'm sure everybody um, faces something similar. Um, how can we, how we can, well, 
um, what kind of measures do you all believe we should take in our professions, um, excluding the Russian parties, um, working with them, uh, working with them, but with no money? Um, and I'm, I'm, I have that question running in my mind because in my profession, people have very different um, attitude and I would tend to myself um, make sure that uh, Russian parties do understand this is not personal, but they're excluded until something is resolved, which is my opinion, but I want to be challenged or not in this opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And last but not least, um, over to Lars, Lars Poisa. Yes, hello. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm the pessimist here in the group, um, <clears throat> mainly because uh, we've been uh, providing uh, actual security and evacuation aid to uh, German companies uh, from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and uh, we've been forward thinking uh, the scenarios. So um, I do believe that uh, Russia will use uh, a tactical nuclear device uh, on a small village um, to shock and awe and bring all fighting to the end, um, mainly because uh, the war will drag on a couple of uh, weeks now. All Ukrainian cities will fall and we will enter into a, a year-long uh, guerrilla campaign against Russian occupation. Oh, thank you so much for also sharing this insight. Um, over to Robin, and since um, Miti, you also had been asked about um, the SPD, I would then also like to give you the last word. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I would like to start with the thought of um, Putin's goal being to keep the democratic virus away. And I think that is that is very strong motivation for him because that was historically when the um, when the war in Ukraine started. It was in 2014 when people on the Euromaidan uh, stood up for a cause towards European Union and uh, for democracy and rule of law and all these things. And uh, that was what uh, Putin could not and did not want to accept in his neighborhood. And um, also we have to see that we do not only face the um, aggression in external policy at the moment, but uh, in the, the last time we also had a very strong uh, race in, in um, repression in Russia. And it's becoming worse and worse every day in Russia for civil society. We have uh, repression against individuals who are being um, um, kept in prison for, um, for speaking up, who are murdered in foreign countries and things like that. We have um, repression against organizations with the foreign agent um, flag to quiet all voices and quite make them quite and, and, and make them disappear not only in the future but uh, also with the results of this um, uh, foreign agent uh, foreign agent um, blaming also in the present and in the past because they they reach back um, and on, on media as well so on society as a whole it's, it's very very severe uh, repress repressive uh, situation in Russia as well and so I'm I totally am I'm with you, Mr. Binnenagel, to, um, to keep a close look on, on uh, Russian civil society, keep them informed and do everything we can to, to give them proper information. Uh, and I think personally, I think we also need to think about um, making up ways to Europe for those who want to flee from Russia at the moment, which is not that easy. So we, we have to think about that as well. And, and I'm very glad to see the bravery of Russians demonstrating and, and even more to see um, flowers in Minsk, in Belarus, you know, which is even more repressive than Russia. So we have definitely have to um, highlight that it's, it's not a war coming from the Russian society or the Belarusian society. It's coming from uh, Mr. Putin and Mr. Lukashenko, those two dictators um, making this aggression against the world. Personally, I think criminal prosecution uh, would be a good thing. I'm, I'm happy about the ICC, ICC prosecution. Uh, we also have uh, national possibilities for prosecution. Um, some weeks before, I um, had conversations with um, Belarusian um, politicians from opposition, from democratic opposition, and pointed out that it's important uh, when dealing with Lukashenko uh, that 
he sees that um, the international society does not accept his crimes and uh, is willing to punish him for his crimes and is willing to to blame him as a criminal and uh, this personally goes to him he, he even uh, took that prosecution and, and brought it up in a press conference complaining about german lawyers bringing up prosecution against him so we see it definitely hurts him and we i think we need that against putin as well um yeah, what I'm, I'm also worrying about is the humanitarian situation, of course, and then we have to think about uh, how to deal with that in, in Europe. Uh, we need a strong European answer on, on, um, on, on refugees and supporting everyone coming from Ukraine, on supporting the countries where they enter the European Union, and also to have a, have a strong uh, um, ways of, of, of uh, yeah, taking up our responsibilities, all of the European countries uh, taking people here. and. Um, really welcoming them um concerning the the reaction to the strategic shift uh, i think it was a very unanimous uh, reaction to the strategic shift concerning russia uh, when you when you look at the reactions we had the standing ovations for the chancellor we had um, very strong unanimous reactions to uh, sanctioning to bringing up the more financial measure everything uh, that, I, that i said it said before actually the only thing where we did not see the unanimous applause uh, instantly was uh, the things targeted towards the means with which we would work in a long-term way in German society uh, on, on, on um, yeah which are like like uh, financial instruments um, and we have to talk about them and but I, personally I think it's it's very clear also for us as a green party that we definitely need to have a stronger army uh, but that is not only we, we, we do not only need money, we need man, more money for military, but we do not only need money for military, we also need other structures because uh, bringing more money in is not enough, it has to be spent well, and we need to have a look at that and a broader security perspective, we definitely need to take into account energy independence um, and um, in the world diplomatic measures and, and all these things as well, and we need to have that within the reaction. And perhaps that may be kind of a discussion we'll have in the next time to, to broaden the perspective of security, but we definitely need that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. And last but not least, um, last words to, to meet. Well, just to join into the negative, um, the negative perspective, even if it wasn't for the ends with uh, with uh, nuclear tactic weapons in Ukraine, even if, if this all works out uh, uh, much faster with a de-escalation. There are tons of weapons out there now for civilians in Ukraine. We have still the unsolved situation between the ethnicities in the East. Uh, Ukraine will not be in, in good shape for, for years to come, come even, if, even in a best case scenario. Um, we have to face the fact that this will be a very, very problematic uh, area in the center of Europe for, for a long time. Um, this will be very, very challenging. Um, but what is also very sure after these just eight days, the, the unity of NATO, um, the unity of the European Union, even outside the, the we were having those discussions don't remember the last the last few years about the new West, not the geographical West, but the West by by values and commitment. South Korea, Japan, um, Australia. It it there is there was a step made forward, right? It's it's happening if if things go really really bad. Um, so what we will do in the future, if 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 this is not going to end in the in the super big catastrophe is that we have to rebuild, as I said before, um, a security framework for Europe that will start, that is new. And that means, uh, we haven't used that word today, what means to, to be based on a strong deterrent on, on the NATO side for a long time to go. Mm -hmm. So what Olaf Scholz said in the 100 billion a Euro program is just one one piece of that. Um, there is no other way to to build up a new system where we can rely on, not only because of Ukraine but because of um, um, geographical challenges. Uh, Carson Folk mentioned Moldova, 
Um, we have other challenges in the West Balkans with Bosnia, even in Africa, um, that we have to accept this new role in a new stage of European history, which will be based on physical military strength from the beginning. And hopefully it will be added by new diplomatic uh, communicative elements of building up a new system. But uh, we are entering now a stage where we have to think about our own security and deterrence first. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we are a little bit over time, but this was a very important meeting. Yes, um, we are seeing pictures from the Ukraine every day. Um, but today, this was a different, different kind of meeting um, because our two um, speakers from the Ukraine, from Kiev, outlined um, their five expectations towards us. And this is something we need to think about and what the implications would be. So I would say we went a lot deeper um, than any kind of coverage you are seeing um, every day. So thank you very, very much to our two um, speakers from Ukraine, Lisa and Helena. Thank you very much, Metin, and thank you very much, uh, Robin, um, to talking with us, to us today, and for to all of our participants. This is a conversation to be continued. Um, next week, we want to meet again to talk about the sanctions and taking a closer look at what they can do, um, what we can expect them to do, um, and the eco economic effects um, of the war. And we will hear from business, um, again, policymakers, um, as well as um, economists um, who are going to share their view. Um, these are dire times um, with lots of uncertainty and lots of, um, lots of pain, really. Um, so thank you so much for, for giving us your time and being with us um, today. Thank you so very much, and I hope to see you all soon.